Hi everyone. Welcome to class. So please let me know if I'm audible and visible and then we can go ahead with our session. Thank you. So today's session is going to be a short session of uh, mainly image based questions. So just like uh, we had done a session a couple of days back which were mainly based on images. So today's session is also on image based questions in Ophthal keeping in mind the recent trend of questions that we've been having over the past couple of years where we are having more uh, clinical and more images. So this is um, this is what we will be doing uh, today. So is the presentation visible to everyone? I hope the presentation is also visible to everybody. Presentation is visible not to everyone. Yes. So let me start off with the first question for today. So which of the following does not cause the condition that is shown in the photograph? So this is the picture that's been given to us and we are asked that which of the following does not cause the condition in the photograph? The options are tuberculosis, sarcoidosis, ankylosing spondylitis and leprosy. So which of the following will you choose here? So please tell me what is the what is the option that you will choose here. Okay. So see the option, the correct answer here is right, it is ankylosing spondylitis. Now then now the next automatic question that comes to mind is why? Why should we choose ankylosing spondylitis as the answer? Now see what is this image about? What is this image? Now this image is see, this is an image of what can we see here? We can see these, these deposits here, these white white dots on the corneal endothelium. What are they called? These white white dots on the corneal endothelium, they are called as keratic precipitates. What are they called? They are called as keratic precipitates. So this is basically a picture of uveitis. Now to be a bit more precise, now look at these keratic precipitates, they are large. They are large and they are coarse. So these are called as mutton fat KPs. They are called as mutton fat KPs. And mutton fat KPs, these are seen in granulomatous uveitis. So basically, this is an image of granulomatous uveitis. Okay. So what do you see in non-granulomatous uveitis? In non-granulomatous uveitis also we will see these kind of deposits on the corneal endothelium. But those deposits, they are going to be very fine, very small. Whereas these deposits, see they are large and they are coarse looking. So they are called as mutton fat KPs. And mutton fat KPs are seen in granulomatous uveitis. So basically this question is trying to ask us which of the following is not a cause of granulomatous uveitis. And that's why we are choosing ankylosing spondylitis as the answer because this causes non-granulomatous anterior uveitis. The others are causes of granulomatous uveitis. Ang spond it causes non-granulomatous anterior uveitis. Abhi dekho, I'll take the opportunity of this question. I will quickly just show you the important causes of granulomatous and non-granulomatous uveitis. So see the important causes of granulomatous are TB, leprosy, syphilis, herpes, sarcoid, VKH disease that is voked koyanagi harada disease, sympathetic ophthalmitis, lens induced uveitis and foreign body uveitis. So these are the important causes of granulomatous uveitis. Right? Now, what are the causes of granulomatous uveitis, non-granulomatous uveitis? In non-granulomatous uveitis, a large percentage is actually idiopathic. So, there is no cause. Now, the other important causes are JRA, then ankylosing spondylitis or what we call as HLA-B27 associated uveitis. HLA-B27 associated uveitis and an important cause is Fuchs heterochromic iridism. So these are the causes of non-granulomatous. 
So if we go back to the question, see in the question, see TB, sarcoid, leprosy, all these are granulomatous. Only ankylosing spondylitis is non-granulomatous uveitis. That is actually B27 associated. And hence the answer. Okay? Let's go to the next question. Today's section is actually a mixed bag. No a particular chapter. Let's look at this question. A five-year-old male child presents with leukocoria. Now, what's leukocoria? Leukocoria means white pupillary reflex. An exudative retinal detachment in the left eye. And the right eye is normal. And this is the clinical picture given to us. So, now we are asked what is the diagnosis. The options are retinopathy of prematurity. That is ROP. Choroiditis, Coats disease or CSCR, that is central serous choreoretin. So, which one should we choose here? What do we choose here? Okay, so one of you has given me the answer Coats disease. Yes, so most of you are saying that it's Coats disease and the answer is correct. The answer is Coats disease. Now, Coats disease, what is it, Coats disease? Coats disease is a condition where you have retinal telangiectasia. So, there are abnormal blood vessels in the retina, abnormal telangiectatic blood vessels in the retina. So, what do these uh, retinal telangiectatic blood vessels do? These retinal telangiectatic blood vessels are associated with severe exudation. And this exudation, it leads to exudative retinal detachment. So, there are telangiectative or abnormal blood vessels in the retina. These abnormal blood vessels are associated with severe exudation. And this exudation leads to exudative art. Now, what are the important things to remember about Coates disease? See, these telangiectatic or abnormal tortuous blood vessels, they are commonly seen in the inferotemporal quadrant of the retina. As you can see in this picture. So, they are seen in the inferotemporal quadrant of the retina and you see this, this yellow thing here, these are the exudates and this exudate, it is related to exudative, it results in exudative retinal detachment. Okay, so these patients, where is this seen? This is typically seen in boys between 5 to 10 years of age. And the presentation, because of all this exudation, the child presents with leukocoria. What's leukocoria? Leukocoria means white pupillary reflex. That is, when you look through the pupil, you will be able to see this area of exudation, exudate retinal detachment. And that's why you will get a white pupillary reflex. So, see, just to summarize everything that I told you about Coates disease, it's a condition where you have abnormal, tortuous, telangiectatic retinal blood vessels. Generally, in the inferotemporal quadrant of the retina, these abnormal blood vessels are associated with severe exudation, leading to exudative retinal detachment. It is classically described in boys between 5 to 10 years of age. And these children, they present with a white pupillary reflex or leukocoria because of this exudation. And very, very importantly, this condition is always unilateral. So, one eye is affected and the other eye is completely normal. So, all these points along with this image together give us a diagnosis of course. Okay. So, this is an old question where I have just changed it a little bit. But this is a question that has been asked many times, many, many times in the exam. Not with the image, but in the form of a case. Okay. Sure. Let's go to the next question. Now, this is the fundus picture of a patient who has presented to us with severe thoracic trauma. Now, what is this? Is it Pucher's retinopathy? Is it rod spot? Is it sympathetic ophthalmia? Or is it expulsive choroidal hemorrhage? What are we going to call this? This is the fundus picture of a patient who has presented to us with severe thoracic trauma. So, what are we going to call this? Okay, now, this is a very, very typical image-based question. Very, completely image-based. What is this? Okay. So, let me tell you, this is typically what you call as Pucher's retinopathy. Now, let me just tell you the important salient points about Pucher's retinopathy. Then, I will come and explain the image. Now, Pucher's retinopathy is a condition where you have multiple retinal emboli. So, there are multiple retinal emboli and these multiple retinal emboli, they block the retinal capillaries. 
multiple retinal capillaries are blocked at the same time because there are multiple embryos. And as a result of these multiple blockages, what is going to happen if multiple small small capillaries are blocked, you will have multiple areas of retinal infarcts. So these white white areas or patches that you see here, these are the areas of retinal infarcts. So what do we call them? We call them cotton wool spots. What are they called? They are the retinal infarcts which are also called as the cotton wool spots. And along with that, because of these, the the blockage of these capillaries, you also have multiple areas of retinal hemorrhages. So see, these are the, the red red patches that you see. These are the retinal hemorrhages. So what is Pucha's retinopathy? Pucha's retinopathy is a very typical condition where there are multiple retinal emboli blocking multiple retinal capillaries as a result of which the retina is full of infarcts and hemorrhages. So these white white patches that you see, these are the areas of retinal infarcts or cotton wool spots and along with that the red patches that we see, they are the retinal hemorrhages. Okay. Now where is Pucha's retinopathy typically described? Pucha's retinopathy is typically described in patients of pancreatitis, pancreatitis and it is also described in patients of head and thoracic trauma, severe, severe head and thoracic trauma and pancreatitis. These are the, these are the, this is where Pucha's retinopathy is classically. Okay? So this is also another image based clinical question. Right? Now let me go to the next question. So let's go to the next one. This is the fundus picture of a patient who presents to us with bacterial endocarditis. Presents to us with bacterial endocarditis. So what is the diagnosis? Pucha's retinopathy, rot spot, sympathetic ophthalmitis, expulsive choroidal hemorrhage. So what are we going to choose here? Correct. This is rot spot. Now, what are basically rot spots? See what you see here, these areas of hemorrhages. These are the rot spots. So, these are these kind of elongated flame-shaped hemorrhages. But you will see that there is a central clearing. So, this central part is clear. So, we have these kind of elongated or flame-shaped hemorrhages. But this central part is actually clear. Okay, so these are typically called as rot spots. Rot spots are classically described in bacterial endocarditis, but you may also get to see them in pernicious anemia. Pernicious anemia. We can get to see them in leukemia and less commonly in patients of diabetes and hypertension also we can get to see. But typically in these questions, either bacterial endocarditis or pernicious anemia will be mentioned. So you will get a, this kind of a picture that is where you have the retina is full of multiple hemorrhages. Retina is full of multiple hemorrhages and at the central part of the hemorrhage, there is a central clearing. There is a central clear or the central part of the hemorrhage is clear. Right? Let's go to the next question. What is the diagnosis from this picture? What is this? Is this showing us a vitreous hemorrhage? Is it showing us a dislocated lens? Is it showing us a retinal detachment or a posterior vitreous detachment? So what are we going to call this? Chuck. So this is a retinal detachment. But first of all, I want you to tell me what is this investigation that you see? What is this investigation? Any idea what this investigation is? This investigation, this picture that we have, this is of a USG B scan. What is it? It's a USG B scan. Now, where do we use a USG B scan? USG B scan is used for evaluation of the posterior segment of the eye in conditions where the media is very hazy. Like for example, suppose we have a very dense cataract. 
right or we have a very dense corneal opacity or we have a dense vitreous hemorrhage and we are not able to see the posterior segment even with an indirect ophthalmoscope generally if we have a hazy media what do we do if we have a hazy media we are going to use an indirect ophthalmoscope but when you are unable to see the posterior segment with an indirect ophthalmoscope also then you can use a sound based investigation that's a b scan to evaluate the posterior so now see the first picture that I have named as picture number one. This is a normal B scan. So in this, this black area that is this hypoechoic part that you see, this is your vitreous cavity. This is the vitreous cavity, hypoechoic, that is black. Now this hyperechoic area that is this white patch that you see, what is that? This is the retinochoroidal complex. This is the retinochoroidal complex. Okay. And this black part that you see, this is the optic nerve head. This is the shadow of the optic nerve head. So we have a vitreous cavity, we have the retinochoroidal complex and we have the optic nerve head. This is what a normal B scan is supposed to look like. Now this is the one that is given to us in the question that is this number 2. So here what do we see is, we see this kind of a membranous detachment and see this membranous detachment, this is attached to your optic nerve head so this is attached to the optic nerve head now this we are going to call as a retinal detachment so if you have this kind of a membranous shadow which is detached from this retina but it is attached to the optic nerve head this is an rd right now if you look at this picture if i name this as three if you look at picture number 3, here also we have this kind of a membranous detachment. But please look carefully, this is not attached to your optic nerve head. You cannot see the optic nerve head shadow and even if you see the optic nerve head shadow, you will find that it is not attached there. What is this called? This is a posterior vitreous detachment or PVD. This is a posterior vitreous detachment or PVD. Okay? So, they go look at this picture. In this picture, we have this kind of a membranous detachment which is attached to the optic nerve head. This we will call as RD. But if you have this kind of a membranous shadow, but it is not attached to the optic nerve head, we will call this as P. And what about picture number 4? Will anybody be able to tell me what is picture number 4 if we get it in the exam? What are we going to call this if we get this kind, this image that is picture 4? See, look at the vitreous cavity instead of being hypoechoic, it is hyperechoic. You see these, these, these opacities in the vitreous cavity? Yes, this is suggestive mainly of a vitreous hemorrhage or it can be a dense vitritis also. But generally, this kind of a shadow we get to see in a VH that is vitreous hemorrhage. So, these are important B-scan images. These are common ones that we usually get in practice and you can get these in the exam also. Okay, sure. Let's go to the next question then. What are the muscles which are acting in this position? So, we have to tell me what are the yoke muscles for this particular position or this particular movement. Sure. So, let me help you. This is the right eye and this is the left eye. So, this position or movement, this is dextro elevation that is Elevating the eye on the right side. This is dextro elevation. So, what is the which are the muscles acting in this position? Look at the options and tell me. The answer is number two. That is right-sided superior rectus and left-sided IO. Now, see these this question is something where students Many students, they have a problem. Now, there are, there's a lot of theory to understand this, but I'll tell you a simple way of arriving at the answer which will help you in the exam. Whenever you get a question on dextro or levo elevation, the first thing that you do is, you write down the names of the elevator muscles. So, which are the elevator muscles? The elevator muscles are superior rectus and inferior oblique. Right? Now, once you have written down the names of, the, of these muscles, now think, now follow this simple rule that the rectus muscle belongs to the side of the movement. The rectus muscle belongs to the side of the movement. So, if you look at dextro elevation, see this is the right-sided movement, right? The patient is lifting his eye on the right side. 
so this is a right sided movement so they are for the rectus muscle that is this rectus muscle is of the right side so it is right superior rectus and of course left inferior of now same logic ko hum levo elevation ke liye bhi we can apply so see levo elevation mein it's a movement of the left side right so the rectus muscle belongs to the left side. so left sided superior rectus and right sided the same thing we can apply for dextro depression and levo depression also this is i mean this is just a simple way of arriving at the answer there is a lot of theory to it but this makes it easy in an exam so when you get a question on dextro or levo elevation first write down the names of the elevators then follow this simple rule that the rectus muscle is on the side of the movement so if it is a dextro elevation the rectus muscle will be of the right side if it is a levo elevation the rectus muscle will be of the left ठीक है चलो लेट्स गो टू द नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन ना लुक एट दिस दिस इज सी दिस इज राइट आई दिस इज लेफ्ट आई सो दिस इज लीवो डिप्रेशन नाउ जस्ट लाइक वी डिड फॉर डेक्स्ट्रो एलिवेशन लीवो एलिवेशन वी कैन अप्लाई द सेम लॉजिक फॉर डेक्स्ट्रो डिप्रेशन लीवो डिप्रेशन आल्सो सो नाउ ट्राई टू अप्लाई दैट एंड टेल मी द पेशेंट इज डिप्रेसिंग द आईज ऑन द लेफ्ट साइड सो दिस इज लीवो डिप्रेशन सो विल यू टेल मी व्हाट इज द आंसर Mm, correct. Left-sided inferior rectus and rightus. So now I think everybody is got it. So see the same logic. We first write down the names of the depressors. That is inferior rectus and superior oblique. Inferior rectus and superior oblique. And then the same lo logic that the rectus muscle belongs to the side of the movement. So dextro depression ke liye see it is a right-sided movement. So rectus muscle is of the right side. similarly levo depression it is a left sided movement so the rectus muscle is of the left side so see left sided inferior rectus right as so so this is theek hai so this is the simple way of arriving at the answer in the exam takes less time and doesn't tax your brain also too much because if we go into the theory it become you have to think a little bit this is much more easier chal let's go to the next question this is a simple question what are the muscles acting in this position so this is right this is left so the patient is simply looking to the left side so this is called as levo version this is levo version the patient is simply looking to the left side so tell me what is this correct so when i look to the left side see the left eye abducts the right eye adducts correct so the abduction of the left eye this is so left eye abduct means left eye lateral rectus and right eye adducts means right eye medial rectus so left eye lateral rectus right eye medial rectus this is these are the muscles for levo version levo version theek hai abhi same the same logic we can apply for dextro version also so dextro version means patient looks to the right side so right eye abducts left eye adducts so for dextro version our yoke muscles will be right sided lateral rectus and left sided medial okay chal let's go to the next one from the picture what is the diagnosis what is this so let me help you this is the right eye and this is the left eye so what is the diagnosis that we have from this picture try the question and then i will explain to you how we arrive at the answer okay so see i'll tell you how to arrive at the answer this test the name of this test this is called as the hirschberg test and this is the most basic test for evaluation of squint now the principle is that when you here we are showing a torch light to a patient and asking the patient to look at the torch light now suppose there is no squint that is if both the eyes are straight then the reflection of this torch is going to fall at the center of the pupil in both eyes that is if there is no squint but suppose there is a squint in one eye 
then what will happen is the reflection of the torch will fall at the center of the pupil in the fixating eye or the normal eye and in the other eye which is deviated the reflection of the torch will not fall at the center so now if you look at this picture see this yellow dot is the reflex of the torch so here the reflection of the torch is falling at the center in the right eye so the right eye is actually normal but in the left eye, see it's not falling at the center. That means it is the left eye which is deviated. Now, how is the left eye deviated? The left eye is deviated inwards, right? So, inward deviation that's called as what? That is called as convergence squint or the technical name for convergence squint is esotropia. So, just by a cursory look at this picture, we understand that it is the left eye that is abnormal because the reflection of the torch is not falling at the center of the pupil. The left eye is deviated inwards. So, it's a convergence squint or it is esotropia. Right now, the question is that what is the degree or the amount of ESO? So, if you see where is this reflection of torch falling, see this reflection of the torch is falling at the limbus that is at the corneoscleral junction. So, that is why the amount of deviation is 45 degrees. So, this is an ESO of 45 degrees. Now, see, many of you are saying 15 degrees. Now, if the reflection of the torch had been here. That is, if the reflection of the torch had been had fallen here, that is at the pupillary margin. That is, if that yellow dot, that is the reflection of the torch, had been at the pupillary margin, then the amount of deviation would have been. Okay, so these are the few things that you have to look for in this kind of an image. So, how do you know which is the abnormal eye? Uh, the eye where the reflection is not falling at the center of the pupil, that is the deviating eye or the, that is the squinting eye. Now, what is the direction of the squint? See, we can make out that this is an inward deviation that's a convergent squint or ESO. What is the amount of deviation? If the reflection of the torch falls at the pupillary margin, then the amount of deviation is 15 degrees. If it falls at the limbus, that's the corneoscleral junction, it's 45 degrees. And if it falls midway, then you can understand from common sense, it's like about, say, 30. So, here, see, it is left eye, ESO, 45. That is the answer. Okay? Let's go to the next question. Now, this is the last question of the day. So, the what is this investigation used for? What is the investigation used for here? Tell me, the picture in this investigation, what is it used for? Correct. This is used for evaluation of dry eye. What is the name of this test? The name of this test is Schirmer's test. So, see, you can see this strip. This is this strip is called as Wattman's filter paper number 41. It is inserted here in the lower fornix, generally at the junction of the medial to third and lateral one third of the eye and you have to see how much of the strip is wetted at the end of five minutes right so this is meant for the evaluation of dry right so these were the few questions that i had in store for you today so i hope that this short session has been useful for you we will be having more such revision sessions both on youtube and our app in the next month for neat pg and i would want you to join all these sessions because we will be doing a quick run through of the entire of the entire uh, syllabus over the next two months that is mainly in the month of april so, those of you who have still not downloaded our app, so please do download the app and start watching our special classes. And in the next month, we will be having a lot of special classes for revision of MCQs for NEED PG. And those of you who want to enroll for our plus subscription, which gives you access to both our live and recorded classes from some of the top educators for medical exams in India, do enroll for the plus subscription. And for that, you can use my code that is DOCSUDHA. And if you want to become a part of both Prep Ladder and an academy, then you have the iconic subscription. And for this also, you can use the code that is DOCSUDHA. And we are having lot of tests for NEED PG and this was the calendar for this month, sorry, for this week.
we will be having more such free tests every week so like we have tomorrow we have this test that is left which is image based uh, test series which will be a mixed bag so these were the tests that were there for this week we will be having more such tests every week and i would want all of you to participate in as many tests as possible because that is what makes you exam ready and on the 20th of march that is we are having this neat pg combat also so you can be a part of this you should also try and be a part of this as well and to just give you an idea about the important batches that are running on our platform see we are having this neat pg 2022 all educators revision batch for this may 20 2022 exam so this is a two month batch which is going to run from this march to the middle of may and all the 40 plus educators are together in this one particular batch we will be having revision of all the 19 subjects and along with subject wise tests as well as grand tests which is going to make you completely exam ready and for those of you who are preparing for the fmg we are having this focus fmg 2022 which is also a two months course where we are going to quickly wind up your preparation and make you exam ready for the june exam right so do enroll for the plus subscription and become a part of all these batches so that you can prepare really well and be confident for whatever exam that you're preparing right so thank you everyone for being a part of this session do join me for the remaining sessions you can download the app and you can join my community and in my community i will be putting up updates about all the special classes that i will be taking. bye bye and good night see you in the next class